Salima Adin is a Salami American fashion model and activist. She is noted for being the first women to wear a hijab on the runway in the Miss Minnesota USA pageant where she was a semi-finalist. She also wore a hijab and burkini in Sports Illustrated magazine. To say the very least, she is an inspiration to many. Thank you for being here, Halima. We're so excited to have you. I will now, I'll now pass it off to Dr. Uma Shankar. So wonderful to see all of you. Wonderful to have you here, Halima. We're going to have a great discussion today. It's going to be very interactive. We have a lot of people that are joining online. We're very lucky about that. But for the people who are here, during our discussion, if any questions pop up, come to the mic. Let's engage with Halima and learn the most that we can from her. Thank you for coming to SDSU. We're really honored to have you. The nice part about Halima is that she's 24. She's very accomplished. But she's also come from a very, very difficult place mm -hmm. and persevered. And so hopefully we can learn from her experiences and how we can tackle some difficult circumstances. Mm -hmm. So Lauren talked about your background. Um, mm -hmm. But I'd love to hear from your words mm -hmm. where you grew up. We know the circumstances, but if you can share some of that and how you came to the US and beyond. OK. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank you, San Diego State University, for hosting this incredible Women in Leadership Conference. Uh, my name is Halima, and my story starts in Somalia. Although I've never been to Somalia myself, my family is from this port city named Kismayo. And I see some Somalis here. Hi! Yay! <laughs> So yes, that's where my family story happened. And my mother, she tells me about the days where she was growing up and you know, her family, they were fishermen and she grew up by the ocean and she has this very nostalgic um, vision of what Somalia used to be. But of course, we all know that didn't last. You know, the Somali civil war broke out and my mom recalls you know, just being in the family home, everything is normal. And one day your entire life is just, it's in smokes and you know, there's fire everywhere. There's people dying, there's violence, there's all these crime. And finally her family and her, they were separated, but she still fled on foot. It was a 12 day journey into Kenya. And I think people sometimes forget, um, forget how that experience unfolds. You know, I'm grateful. I was born and raised in a refugee camp, one of the world's largest refugee camps by the time my mom went to Kenya. But for her story, you know, she talks about the militia that were waiting for people as they crossed the borders, all the crime that happened, you know, all the violence. And it definitely wasn't an easy trek for a woman. Mm -hmm. And so nonetheless, she made it to this place uh, named Ken uh, Kakuma, Kenya. That's where I was born and raised the first seven years of my life. And it's had both scars and smiles. That's the best way I can put it. You know, it taught me some of the world's biggest pressing issues very early on, I was faced with them. I remember the nights where we had malaria, didn't have food on the table, heck, didn't even have a table to begin with. And I remember the joy, the singing, the dancing, the liveliness and, you know, people what they don't have in material things, they made up in love and community. And to this day, like, I'm so proud that I had that very strong sense of community in my childhood. And I've struggled throughout my life in America to regain that same level of community. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. It's such a difficult background, but I really appreciate you sharing that with everyone here. Mm -hmm. How did you transition from at seven years old, you were seven years old when you left, going from a refugee camp where everyone around you looks like you mm -hmm. to just being told you're going to live in Minnesota? How did you adjust? It was, it was quite the journey. And um, I'll be fair, we did not know about winter in Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was a detail that was left out. And so um, back to the camp though, you know, we all were Africans, but we were Africans from all over Africa. Yeah. You know, I had friends from Rwanda. I had friends who are South Sudanese. I had friends from Ethiopia, all these different parts of, of the continent. And 
I remember one of my very first like memories was the fights that would break out because people were in long lines for the well and fights would happen, people would miscommunicate. What is okay and acceptable in one culture is a complete insult to a different mm -hmm. culture. Like something as simple as like petting somebody on the head. In one culture, it's a sign of apology and sincerity. In the other one, it's like a form of de degradation. Mm -hmm. And so fights would happen over hand gestures. And so it taught me to be very diplomatic early on because I was already the smallest and I was like, I'm not trying to get beat up here. <laughs> and so <laughs> it taught me to be a better communicator. And for the kids, we were genuinely family. You know, the fights that our parents had and, you know, the different cultures that they all came from and different religions, it caused for separation among the adults. But for the children, we were all one. Mm -hmm. You know, we played, we had fun and we found ways to find joy in like the littlest things. That's really nice. Did you find that you could keep that level of um, innocence and simplicity when you came here? No, so my family, like many refugees, you know, I think that's a stereotype, like you get to come to this beautiful country and you get to decide your fate. It's really winning the billion dollar lottery. You know, A, 1% of refugees get to migrate to a country that's developed like America. The rest either go back to their native countries or they get resettled to neighboring countries. And so when my family got the okay light, there was this big board at the refugee camp and it still exists today where they stamp the refugee family that is accepted to relocate and where they go. And so it was this whole ritual, like people would just all come stand and see the lucky family. And those were the first days where I cried. I, I was like inconsolable because I had made the connection that I would never see my friends again. Yeah. And here my mom is like, hallelujah, like <laughs> we're getting out of here. <laughs> and so um, we land in St. Louis, Missouri, because you don't really get a say as to which community, you know, you end up in. And so when we were in St. Louis, that was the first time I heard gunshots in my entire life. It was the first time where I felt very dumb. Like in the camp, I had a lot of confidence because I was like among the kids who spoke fluent Somali and Swahili, mm -hmm. which is the common language. And so I felt very vibrant, even in the camp. And then to go to a school without an ESL program, ELL program, it was very hard because I just, I thought I was below everybody. Like I thought I was just a dumb kid and I couldn't, communicate with the staff and then I would come home with the pressure from my mom like why aren't you reading we have all this mail and I need you to translate for me which most seven-year-olds don't that that's not the reality but that was my reality and so eight months of living in in St. Louis Missouri my mom made a choice she said in a lot of ways I feel like I'm giving up one horrible situation like the camp and like fleeing and wanting better for my kids and security and now here I am faced with these challenges where it's a very crime-filled neighborhood it, it has statistics for like highest murder rates in America and so she was like do I wait and see if one of my kids ends up in prison ends up in the wrong you know like circle so she got a phone call one day and they're like, come to Minnesota, <laughs> it's, it's great. And so she moved the entire family on a Greyhound bus, three day journey, I believe it was, to St. Cloud, Minnesota. How did she choose that place? Word of mouth, like many Somalis, like we communicate mm -hmm. word of mouth. <laughs> so you're natural marketers, I guess. Right? <laughs> But you talked about the self-esteem and because you couldn't speak English or do certain things, uh, feeling less confident. One of the topics for this conference is how to build confidence. How did you build confidence over time? You know, I stuck out like a sore thumb. A, we were like among the very first Somalis to migrate to St. Cloud, Minnesota. And it's a very German um, population. Like a lot of the people there, they trace their roots back to Germany. Mm -hmm. And it was also predominantly white community. And so I, I, I can understand like where the struggles came from, because here's a community that's accustomed to not change. And here's a community that brings about a lot of change, <laughs> you know, so it was a very, um, you know, like you would see 
people having walkouts, like our schools, like even the idea of having prayer time, people were like, well, we can't, as Christians, like we can't do this, so why do they get to do this? And so it was just very unfortunate. And I understand both sides because, you know, I remember the change and like how it can be hard and un uncomfortable sometimes. And I think what gave me confidence is I had teachers that saw me, that believed in me. I get so emotional thinking back to like some of my teachers from elementary school, like they would pull me out of recess and like study with me. They would never send me home with homework. They would always make sure I finished it in class. And I think a part of that is like my mom, who's illiterate, would always show up to the school and like every day she wanted to make sure she wasn't making the same mistakes as in St. Louis. And so seeing the effort that she was putting into my education, like I think they really felt bad and were like, okay, we're your second parents now. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of like what gave me confidence. And I had one teacher in particular who would always be like, speak up, even if you have an accent, even if it's heavy, just speak up. I really like that because I was going to ask you, what does confidence look like in reality? So one thing is speaking up. What are other things that you think? You know, when I was younger, I'd be like, confidence is Beyonce. Confidence <laughs> is, yeah. you know, the women that we look up to and, you know, we're inspired by. But confidence can also look like being silent, you know, not being humble, having humility you know, walking into spaces and instead of just thinking about yourself, okay, who can I pull a chair at the seat of the table for? Like who's missing from our table that we should be reaching out to? I think that's confidence, like what you do for other people. Cause sometimes, you know, like especially this population, like our, our generation, like we're very much into Instagram. It's me, 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 me. And the people, and I worked in the fashion industry, some of the most insecure people I've ever met in my life mm -hmm. were fellow models, supermodels. So it, it shows you like you could be the prettiest, you could be the tallest, you could have all these accolades, but if you don't have that inner silent confidence of like, I got this and I'm in a space where I don't need to compete with other women. Matter of fact, I'm here to pull up a, a seat at the table for others like me. I think that is like the essence of confidence when it has nothing to do with you and everything to do else with, with, with how you interact with others. That's beautiful. So empowering others gives you confidence yeah. or is a confident thing to do. That's yeah. really nice. And when you talk about your fashion background and being a supermodel, how did you remain authentic? Because you had to take risks to be authentic. So I want to learn about weighing the risks versus authenticity. Yeah, I mean, we all know like fashion is very much, it's outwardly. It's what you wear, what you convey, like you're supposed to be silent, unseen, unheard, just wear beautiful clothes, take beautiful pictures. Um, but I think a lot of the reason why my journey is slightly unique is because I didn't, I didn't, look or search for fashion. It just fell from the sky into my lap. And I competed for Miss Minnesota USA back in 2016 for scholarship money for, for university. And then boop, 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 before I know, within the same week, like this pageant was November 26 and 7. And within that same week on Monday, I had a call from Rihanna's team. Not to name drop, but I'll name drop. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, say that again? <laughs> Rihanna's team? Rihanna's team, yeah. Wow. After the news went viral because it was the first time somebody wore a hijab and burkini for the pageant. And so that happened on Monday. I was like, let me look at my other options and get back to you. <laughs> no, I jumped at it. And then uh, this, that following Tuesday, a call from IMG Models, as maybe some of you know, is one of the world's largest modeling agencies. And then that Wednesday, I was on a flight to New York City for the first time in my life. Now, the only time I ever was on a plane was coming into this country and praying that it's not on a return. <laughs> wow. But um, so that happened. And then literally within the end of that week, I had shot my first ever cover, you know, and was on the runway for Kanye West season five, you know, New York City show, New York Fashion Week show. And so all this is happening within a week within a week and people you know
think I'm lying or I'm crazy because like you know, like models will work from the ages 13 to 25 in hopes of one day landing a cover, in hopes of one day getting to close a show. And so it really, I think I was privileged enough, like I didn't even have experience. And here because of my hijab and story and like I think the industry was hungry for true inclusivity and diversity, it was all part of the package privilege of being the first. This incredible story, I mean, she's really incredible. Um, do you think that the industry truly uh, imbibes that, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion in terms of who they promote, you having your own say in your career, or is it more that they give lip service to it in certain ways, but maybe not others? Do you think there's room for improvement? Oh, there's always room for improvement. And that industry, I think sometimes it's like, okay, checklist. We have the hijabi check. We have the black girl check. We have an Asian girl check. So we must be very inclusive. And the problem is, um, it shouldn't even be talked about. Like your runway should have already been inclusive. And B, what I struggle with is like, we talk about people our age, but who are the consumers of high fashion? It's not young, like 16 to 23 year olds. It's actually a more mature, like, you know, group of people. It's women in their 30s, women in their 40s, heck, women all the way to 80 that can finally, you know, be like, okay, I'm spoiling myself. I've, I've worked hard my life. Like now I'm, you know, it's not for us. And so I think, you know, where are the middle class women, middle aged women on these runways? Where are the women in their 70s? Like, you know, there's such a big overlooked um, group of women that don't get representative. And so I think as we're stuck on, do they have an Asian model? Do they have a black model? Do they have a plus size model? We're neglecting whole different groups of women. Okay, where are the women with disabilities? Mm -hmm. You know, where? And so it's much greater than, okay, we have all the skin tones represented, you know? And we see the hype, like Rihanna came out with 52 shades of foundation for every skin tone. This is only happening back in 2016. And then what did all the beauty brands do? They jumped to it. Oh, look at our range. We have all the concealers. And so sometimes I just feel like even the people behind the scene, mm -hmm. You know, the casting directors, the, the editorial um, editors at, at, at Chief or in Chief, all these people that are part of the moving, you know, moving. Moving parts behind. Moving them. parts behind fashion. I think I want to see more diversity within their board of directors. Like the people behind the scenes also need to be diverse. Very, very true. Very true. How, how do students get involved? How do people get involved after college? if they feel like it's so difficult to eat? Where do you start, I guess? Where yeah. do you start? Well, I started at the top, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, <laughs> but, but authenticity. Why? Because there was an entire space, an entire group of women, Muslim women, that were neglected when it comes to high fashion. Mm -hmm. And so even in the very beginning of my career, I didn't know anything about contracts. I didn't know anything about uh, legal lingua or you know the business of fashion, but I did know you need me more than I need you. So I walked into that agency with two paragraphs that I typed up on my Google Docs and I was like, <laughs> and I worked on it with my mother, you know, cause I was like, if I'm doing this, like I need your blessings. And she was like, fashion modeling, that's haram, that's not our culture, please don't do that. Let it not be my kid to do this. And so, <laughs> fair enough. And so I was like, I wrote two paragraphs and I was like, this is my hijab clause because I'm not about to be the first hijab wearing model that throws away her hijab three months later because I was put into situations that made me question my values. And so I had a whole two paragraph clause. I only travel with women. I only, I still live in Minnesota, you know, most models have to relocate to New York or a fashion capital, but I know nope, to this day, I'm still in Minnesota, all these things to protect myself. And I had no idea about the business. I was so naive. I thought every model 
had those clause in their contracts. And then the older I got, the more model friends I, I, I got, the more I realized my ignorance of how the fashion industry works, it was actually a blessing because I, I was confident to walk into that room and be like, you want me to sign a contract? Well, here's, here's where I stand and here's where you can meet me. And if I had known even a little bit more about how it works, I would have been like, no, I'm too scared. They're gonna say no, they're gonna laugh me out of the room. And so ignorance sometimes is the biggest blessing. That's really interesting. That's really, because it, say they, you got to that opportunity that you really wanted and they rejected you. They said, no, you cannot wear that. You cannot have these demands. What would you have done? Or did you face that? I didn't. That's what I want us women to really know. Like when you stick to it and you know what you stand for and you know what you bring to the table, like most people will meet you where you stand. Like that's just the nature of the world we're living in. You know, people, especially now, they want to empower women. They want to, we see all these companies coming out with like, oh, we have these quotas now where it's like 25% women. And I'm just like, it could be like 50, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you go be proud with your 25. <laughs> but um, so I think sometimes just owning it and being confident, because like we're women, sometimes it's like, I feel like we put ourselves on the back burner and we don't want to make anybody uncomfortable, but learn to be comfortable with that uncomfortableness. I love that. So, so what's an example of, say you were in an interview and someone was trying to push back, you would just say what to them? Well, before I even showed up, they had to sign that contract that said <laughs> I have my own private dressing space. And yeah. oh my goodness, guys, I cannot believe in 2022. Like, they, that's not something that's common within the industry. People don't realize, like, a private dressing space was unheard of because most models, the excuse is you need to change in and out, in and out, and it's a busy show. And I don't know if you guys have seen backstage, but models are expected to change with just the clothes separating them from the public, separating them from the photographers, separating them from the food professionals. And so, like, I would literally, from the beginning of my career to the end of my career, they would always be a black box with curtains like this, separating where I dress from the other girls. And it just made me sick to my stomach. I'm like, why can I walk into literally Walmart and there's a private men's fitting room, private female, you know, like why not make it accessible to everybody? But did you face any pushback from the other models or feel that you were different and did they treat you differently in a, in a negative way? I think sometimes it was like a competition thing. Like here's this girl who's clearly sh way shorter than any other model here. And it's true, I'm only five, five and a half. And so, <laughs> and most girls are five, nine and up. And so I think there was like a little bit of like, why does she get this when we've been in this industry way longer and like we're more successful and like, you know, where's my dressing space? And then I would come back the following season and sure enough, the three most popular girls walking the show, all of a sudden it was three boxes for the three of us. And I was just like, oh my God, like, no, no, <laughs> just no, just don't do that. <laughs> so in the, in the situations in general, professionally or personally, how do you, handle stress and anxiety. Is it productive for you or how do you manage that with also your career goals? I think my stress was coming from the fact that, you know, a lot of, like I didn't know where I was going with my career. You know, I was being pulled in like 50 different directions and I lost touch with like what my purpose was to begin with and you get to a place where I don't want to say complacent, but I was like, I have it good. So, you know, if the other girls really wanted it, they could write it in their contracts. And like growing up and seeing, no, you actually open a door to an industry that can be extremely unsafe. Mm -hmm. That's where my core stress came from, like this feeling of guilt. And I didn't know at the time, but also like, I don't know if you guys maybe heard of survivor's guilt. I had no idea I was harboring so much survivor's guilt and that's why I would like always feel like my career came too easy. You know, if, if this was something I truly worked hard for, 
why am I here? Like I felt very, I still felt like the little girl in a refugee camp, despite all these fancy rooms I'd be in and like these very successful people and like all these amazing things. I just never really felt like, sorry, this is a lot, but. No, tell us, this is, this, we want to hear it. Yeah, I struggled with accepting that I belonged mm -hmm. in that space. How did you overcome that? Have you overcome that? I think by me no longer settling to be the only one who looks like me in that space and actually, you know, pressuring people to have more than just your token hijab Muslim girl, that's helped me feel less guilty. Less guilty when it comes to where you came from? Guilty and like also, okay, I do belong in this space because so-and-so looks exactly just like me and now the door is open for her. You know, that's what like helped me like overcome those feelings of not enough, not, you know, like not belonging. And it, it was good, like seeing others who look like you, who have overcame similar, you know, situations knowing that they're in the room with you, mm -hmm. they're allies, you know, and so it makes you feel better. Do you feel pressure to always be confident and have to work through those feelings uh, to be a role model to other people? Or how do you also deal with that pressure? Pressure is inevitable. Trust me, I worked mm -hmm. housekeeping at St. Cloud Hospital. Pressure is real. Tell, <laughs> us, tell us about that experience. Or that. Oh, boy, do I have the story for you. So I was in high school. I already had a job, by the way. I was working at FDC, Packaging Center. And of course, like a lot of Somali youth, you're, not, you're expected to have your bills paid, but also there's a family back home that you have to also take care of and look after. And so I found myself looking for a second job. Here I am on the website. It says EVS, Environmental Specialist. I was like, oh my God, I'm about to be a doctor. Like, <laughs> and they say, they say you can wear scrubs. I was like, oh my God. And so I show up giddy, like so excited. And they're like, okay, here, here are the scrubs. These are the bathrooms that need to be cleaned today. And it's actually a janitorial position that they just nicknamed environmental service specialist. <laughs> and so I stayed there for two years. I loved the, the girls that I worked with. And even seven months into modeling, guys, I kept my housekeeping job. So much so that the Star Tribune, they were like, no way. And so I was like, yeah, way. And they were like, okay, we're gonna come document everything. <laughs> and now there's like all these pictures of me flipping the bed over and like scrubbing that toilet clean. And they just couldn't believe I was walking Milan Fashion Week and coming back by three, checking into my job at St. Cloud Hospital. But I didn't know if this was gonna be human trafficking. I was like, it looks really good on paper, but what if they try to pressure me to do this? So that was my backup plan. I was like, I... The backup plan was working there and... And going and, to school. Yeah, I was yeah, like yeah. a freshman at St. Cloud State. And so, I kept that job for seven months into modeling because I, I was like still feeling out the waters yeah, and yeah. seeing if it was safe for me to even pursue it. I, I, I wish we had so much more. We're, we're going to transition now, but we're transitioning to questions from students so that they can engage with you. Okay. Um, and while we transition to that, we have some, I don't know the term, fireback her? Rapid fire. Rapid fire, <laughs> Rapid fire questions for you, Halima. You are just amazing. Oh, thank you. Love Dr. You. Nita. No, no. <laughs> uh, what do I do? Okay. Instagram or Twitter? I get the tea from Twitter, <laughs> but I also love Instagram. <laughs> I get the tea from Twitter. Okay. Favorite workout music? Ooh. Hands down. Ooh, that girl, she's scandalous. Da, 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 da. That one, that one gets me going every time. I was like, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, no, she has uh, no idea. I do, I do. Um, <laughs> oh, not the thong song. Oh. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Okay, next the one. Thong. <laughs> uh, what are you binge watching right now? Um, okay, so everybody's been trying to get me into euphoria, but 
I was like, I don't think that's hijab appropriate. <laughs> you're just watching, you're not doing, so you can, you know. Uh, favorite book or podcast? Oh, okay, so podcast is definitely Super Soul by Oprah Winfrey. It's just, it's so good for the soul. Yeah, so good. That sounds great. Career outside of fashion, you're an activist also, but career outside of fashion. I would definitely be a second grade teacher. Wow. Yeah, because my, my second grade teachers were my everything, you know? And so to, to give that to another child, that would be a dream. That's wonderful to hear. Your superpower, or you have superpowers, what would you want your superpower to be? Okay, so this one is living in the West. Okay, bear with me. So back home, it was so easy to read people's emotions. Like there was, there were just, you could feel the energy, you could feel the vibe, you knew exactly who needed that extra hug. And like living in like the West, I feel like sometimes even the way we communicate with each other, it's like, when was the last time somebody was like, how are you? You're like, I'm good, how are you? I'm yeah. good. And so I feel like the best superpower we could all have is like, imagine if you could feel, not just empathy, but feel how people were truly feeling on the inside. I think suicide rates would go down. I think a lot of the problems and loneliness that people are feeling, they all go down and then we can be better connected as humans and you would know exactly, you know, there's no, I'm good. Like now I don't say I'm good. I'm like, do you really, do you have time? Okay, I have five minutes. This is what's happening. This is the guy that pissed me off. This is what my mom said that angered me and triggered me. And like, you know, like, do you have time to, for me to answer that question? How are you? And so I, I just hope that we could get to a place in society where people are just more vulnerable and open with how they're doing, how they're feeling. <laughs> Incredible, that was amazing. I hope you feel it from us, that was really amazing. Thank so you. how are you guys feeling? <laughs> so we'll have Lauren call up people for questions. Thank you. Thank you. you are so amazing. Halima, I just cannot believe everything you said so far. I'm in awe. So please feel free to line up if you have questions. I do have a question myself. I feel like as young women, it can be difficult to stand up for ourselves. You, yourself, an activist, what keeps you going and what motivates you to stand up for yourself and what advice do you have for us young women here today? Yeah, I would just say like, don't even think about yourself, but think about the next girl that's like following in your footsteps, the next girl that comes next after you. So when you don't speak up, you're doing a disservice to the next. And so think of it as like, okay, this is like my favor to the girl coming up after me. The fact that I've been asked for that pay increase, the fact that I asked for, okay, I need, I need a personal time. I can't just work, 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 you know? So think of like all the things that might be uncomfortable for you to do in the moment, but will help the next girl. Cause now she knows it's a safe space for you to voice your concerns, opinions, everything. Thank you. Megan, you were first, go ahead. First of all, it's so great to see you and have you here today. You're amazing and beautiful on the inside and out and so well-spoken. And I love the fact that you want to be a second grade teacher because my mom is one too Aww. and best grade. But anyway, my question is, um, what inspired you to leave the modeling industry and what are your plans for the future, if you know? Ooh, so modeling, I, I, it was a love-hate relationship. Like, A, I feel like we should not aspire to be models. Like we should aspire to be great educators, great mentors, great siblings, great daughters and sons, but modeling, like, I don't think anybody should aspire to be a model, you know? And I say that because you see the models like 20 years in, like they become a shell of who they once were because it's an industry where they say, oh, you make the most amount, like out of uh, women make the most money in that industry more than any guy but it's also an industry that's not the safest and especially for young girls, mm -hmm. like it's not a safe industry. And so I would just say that was part of the reason why I left. Cause I'm like, if my little sister, like it's a no, no for me, for her to enter, why am I there to begin with? And to answer your second question. Oh, sorry. Um, what are your plans for the future if you know? I'm writing a children's book. No. <laughs> 
Yeah, I wanna, I wanna humanize, cause you know, um, I talk about my story journey with mostly adults, you know, and, and like young women and girls, but I wanna write a book where it's humanizing refugee children, and it's a way for parents to open up that conversation about real pressing issues that's happening globally, but in a way that still makes the, the child feel like, okay, I could do something, or maybe I could grow up and like change this, but not in a way where it's like scars and like all the evil things that happen, a way that's still child friendly, but opens that conversation for parents to then talk about the refugee crisis. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you. alaikum. Alaikum salam. Um, so my question is, uh, what advice do you have for a young Muslim woman who want to be in either the fashion industry or any industry and who are afraid of rejection and judgment because of their hijab? Well, I, I genuinely hope that I took one for the team. <laughs> the fashion industry is never going to be shook. Trust me, I quit in the most savage way. <laughs> if you follow me on Instagram, you already know the team. <laughs> so I would say, like, you know, if you're pursuing fashion, just make sure you know who you are before you enter. You know, and I don't say that to scare you because fashion is fun. You wake up, you get your nails done, you get your makeup done, you get, you get to wear beautiful designer clothes, but it, it has bad influences, you know, and it just breaks my heart because so many young girls, like they deter from actual dreams. Like I wanna be a teacher, I wanna be a lawyer one day, I wanna, have, I wanna be a homeowner. And they like hyper focus on a career in modeling and the industry chews them up, spits them out, replaces it with the next 16 year old. So I would just say always have your plan B, plan C, plan D before you enter a career in influencing. Like we see the good sides, like, oh, this influencer sitting from home is making 25K and you feel like as a student pursuing your education, pursuing higher ed, sometimes you feel like, well, these girls are making money from basically doing nothing. And so why am I working my butt off to, to focus on school and what's in front of me? And I think sometimes you forget, like it's not all glitz and glamor and what you see on the gram. These girls have to go through a lot, a lot of abuse, neglect, and things that just focus on your school. Thank you. So uh, just before the question, clarification, you said you already know the T. What does that mean? Oh, you don't know the T. She doesn't know the T. That just tea? means that just means you already know. Like you already know what I'm saying. That's all it means. Like you already know the T. Like T. Like T. <laughs> like you already know the gossip. The okay, okay, I'm gonna start using that. Thank you. I can't believe the professor is learning something from me. <laughs> I've learned many things from you today. Many things. So I know you mentioned at first like how you had to translate documents or like letters for your parents and I think a lot of first gen Americans can really resonate with that. How did you like kind of overcome like the guilt and the pressure that comes with our parents like paving their lives and their careers to come here and maybe just kind of make our lives happen? Yeah, I mean it just it never goes away like that feeling of I can never like I can never thank my mom in this lifetime properly for what she's done for me. And you know, like I'm Muslim. And so we have this saying where even for one contraction, one discomfort, one second of that, while your parent is giving birth to you, you can never repay. You can bring her on your back all the way to Saudi Arabia for Mecca, and that still will never be enough. And so it goes your mother, your mother, your mother, and then your father. No shade at the dads. <laughs> no shade to the dads, but you know, so you feel like you can never be good enough. And I think sometimes instead of like dwelling on that, just make it like for self-improvement. Like I could always be a, a better daughter. I could always be a better student. I could always be you know, better at work. And so I think like using that as a source of inspiration to continuously try to better yourself, that's enough of a thank you. Thank you.
And translating, translating for my mom, I can't even lie, y'all. The amount of fake uh, report cards I've made. <laughs> First of all, I want to say mashallah to everything you said about your mother because Jannah is at the feet of our mothers. Mm -hmm. And um, my question to you is, um, do you have any pieces of advice or words of wisdom for young girls who are not only struggling to put on the hijab, but also to keep it on? It's hard and it's a hijab journey. You know, nobody's perfect. And I would just say, take it easy on yourself, you know? And sometimes I understand why women take off the hijab. It's not safe, especially post 9-11. You know, you, I understand completely, like people just being too scared to be judged, to, you know, be discriminated against. And you have countries like France banning the hijab in public places. You have the situation in Germany where the employer, they took it all the way to like their highest Supreme Court and the employer had every right to fire a woman wearing a hijab. And so it's definitely not an easy time, but I would say like everything else, like follow your heart when it's the right time for you, it's the right time for you. And just know your reasons. You know, like for me, it's like a symbol of my faith. And it was also the reason why I started wearing the hijab because my mom lived in St. Cloud where there was a lot of problems with people who looked like us. And so I wanted to show her we're in it together. Like, see, we're doing it together. And so just know why it is that you're wearing it to begin with. And just know like anything else in life, it's not always gonna be good. Thank you so much. First off, assalamu alaikum Halima. It's nice to hear you speak to us today. Um, I'd just like to say that like you were saying when pictures of you in your pageant were surfacing back then, I was like in high school and I remember seeing those pictures and saying like, wow, somebody that looks like me from the same country as me is not only just a hijabi, but I can resonate with in multiple different ways. Like, I could see you as a role model. Mm. And I know you had like a community backing you through all of that. And so with that in mind, you have people supporting you and people who are looking up to you. But when you went home at the end of the day, who could you look up to? And who was the community that you could look back on? Yeah. Oh my God, you guys are <laughs> making me cry. <laughs> and this makeup took two hours, so <laughs> please <laughs> um, I would say, you know, what I really love is the fact that, yeah, originally it was like my Somali community, my tribe. And the more my career progressed, the more I progressed as, a, as an individual, my community is like this whole world. Like there's a, a part of my story that you could relate to. And that's a superpower, you know? It just means that I can, I can, I'm able to connect with more people than I ever could have imagined. You know, people from, the displaced communities who are like, oh my goodness, I so totally reflected with, with your story as like a child refugee, you know, first generation. Like there's so many parts of my story that has led me to new communities. You know, even being here, this is now my San Diego State University community. And so just thank you all so much because it, it truly is so humbling to know that we're able to connect on a deeper level and things that we originally thought separate us, make us different from one another. It's actually, it's actually a great thing. Yeah, it is, it's a gift. I'm the five nine giant, so I'm just <laughs> done now. <laughs> um, my question is, first of all, salam alaikum. Um, I have a sister who just recently like broke into like the modeling world and we saw her like for the first time on a billboard in New York and <gasps> I remember like all of us were like celebrating but my mom was like like you know Somali moms are like very protective of us especially when it comes to like you know those sort of like industries and everything and like I was also in high school when I seen like the first time I mean middle school actually the first, the first time I seen you like you know break into the Miss uh, Minnesota pageant and just thinking like oh my god like we're on the map, Somalia finally doing something other than be noticed as pirates, you know? Uh, <laughs> so it was pretty, um, it, I feel like it was just welcoming to see like you are taking those strides and like looking up to you and like never, like 
ever forgetting your roots as like a Somali woman, um, what would be your advice to her to like make sure like she never has to be put in situations where she has to compromise her hijab? Because thankfully New York let her have her hijab on for the billboard, but you never know, you know? <laughs> no, I, I always say it, like I got to a place where I wanted to walk away from it and I had my reasons, but it's not to say that you can't be a supermodel and find great success and you know while still remaining true to who you are um, I just felt like being the first like that's a tremendous amount of responsibility and so I feel like by me walking away from it it gives every hijabi model that's coming up and coming the opportunity to know oh like I can put into my contract a private dressing room like I don't need to go change in a bathroom or in a public setting like oh I can travel with a female instead of opting, you know, traveling with a male agent and like little stuff like that. But with anything in life, like you need to be able to walk away when, when things are testing your boundaries, especially for all women. Like, you know, when you're put in a position where all of a sudden you're questioning your morals and values, like you need to be willing, willing to walk away from any and all situations that don't benefit your heart. You know, at the end of the day, like, I want to sleep good, knowing I did my part, knowing I didn't lead astray, like, a group of young women who are, you know, looking at my career and thinking, oh, great, like, this is what I'm going to do. And then for them to be abused or used or not treated with basic human, like, dignity, I can't sleep with myself at night. So I'm hoping by my actions, every single model should be able to speak up. Thank you. This will be our final question for Halima. Hi, thank you so much for coming. It's been such a pleasure to have you here. I would love to hear a little bit more about your journey when you were first entering the industry, such a, an unfamiliar space with contracts coming at you, legal uh, propositions. What was it like entering that space with no one to turn to for help? Who did you turn to? Who were your mentors as you were entering the space? Yeah. So I didn't have like financial support to even take my contract to a legal person, like outside of like their in-house legal. And so what I did was I ripped apart that contract. Every single word I didn't understand, I would Google. <laughs> I don't recommend anybody doing this, but I also looked up commission, you know, and I couldn't find, this is the thing about the entertainment industry. like. I'm sure like other industries like pay, especially in America, we don't like to talk about money, you know, and it keeps us women very far behind because imagine if everybody was open and honest, you would ask for better raises, you would ask for better benefits. So I think it's such a huge disservice when we among ourselves never discuss commissions, never discuss what's normal, never discuss when we get that job promotion and what work you are doing, because you could be doing double the work that she's doing and be earning three times less and you would never know. And so I would say like the industry, they keep everything hush hush, but I'm here to tell you 20% is average. What every single up and coming model, that's what, you, that's what you pay if you're with an agency. Now, once you get to a place where you establish yourself, like you know, like part of the work that's coming your way, it's because of past work that you did. And so you're at a level in your career where you can ask for more. And agencies, it's not rare to ask for 10%. Once they know that you're able and willing to get work coming through the door, that's something that people negotiate. But I would say always take your contracts to a third party don't do what I did, <laughs> but it worked out just fine, you know, because thank God I, I operate from good faith, you know, and I've never been screwed over ever. And so I think sometimes like when you have pure intentions and the people that you work with are not sketchy or shady, it, 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 it will work out. Thank you. That will conclude our final keynote for the 2022 Women in Leadership Conference. In a moment, I'll invite Mr. Osinski up for his closing remarks, but I just want to say, Dr. Uma Shankar, thank you for leading this discussion. Halima, I could listen to you all day <laughs> long. Thank you so much for being here. I can't extend enough thanks to you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Helena.